Hello, thank you for tuning in. I'm Maurice Barrett. I've got another study in the Preparing for Christ's Return series. This study is called A Better Resurrection. And I've got a scripture to start off with, Luke 20, verse 35 and 36. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. We're talking about a better resurrection, that's the time. So let me read it again in the light of that. But they which shall be accounted worthy, so not everyone, those that are accounted worthy to obtain that world, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Well, this study is taken from the, a book I've written, and the, the book's actually called A Better Resurrection. It's the first book in the Preparing for Christ Return series. And the study's in that book, and it's available from Amazon as a paperback or Kindle download. And it's available from our Barrett Ministry sh shop on Shopify. We'll put the details up at the end of the video. Well, we'll we're going through a, a, a series in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. And we've looked at the conditions for obtaining the resurrection. Let's read it, Philippians 3, verse 10. These are the four points, and we've, we've had four studies to look at that. Paul said that I may know him, not know about him, but know him. That's a personal relationship. The power of his resurrection, there's a whole study on that. And I was showing it's not the power to resurrect us. We all understand that. It's the power that we'll have when we're resurrected. A resurrected body has great power and glory, and we looked at that. And the last study... Uh, the last two studies, the fellowship of his suffering. They that suffer with Christ will also reign with him. And the last study, made conformable unto his death. That doesn't mean we die physically, but we have to die to self. We have to mortify the deeds of the flesh. And all this is, the culmination of this is that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto death, if by any means I may obtain the resurrection. So we're talking about this resurrection because the four points are only culminating in the resurrection. In other words, these are the conditions to be resurrected. Paul said, if by any means I may obtain the resurrection. So, that means it's not a foregone conclusion, if by any means. So it, it, Paul wasn't certain that he would be in the res resurrection, but certainly when he wrote to the Philippians. So if Paul wasn't assured, if he said by any means, then is the modern church more prepared, more holy than Paul, more qualified than Paul to be in this resurrection? If Paul said, if by any means, why would the church think, well, I'm saved, I'm in the, this resurrection. When Jesus comes, I'm going to be in the resurrection. We're arrogant if we, if we, we think, because Paul said that I may, if any, by any means. Well, Paul talks about a cloud of witnesses that have gone before. Hebrews eleven thirty five. And these cloud of witnesses will testify for us and against us. I used to call them the, the list of heroes of faith. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Noah did this. By faith, and it goes through Joseph and Moses, all what they'd achieved by faith. But actually, it doesn't call them examples of heroes. It said they're witnesses. A great cloud of witnesses, not examples. There's a big difference. An example is somebody you follow. A witness is somebody who speaks for you or against you. You could be a witness for the prosecution or a witness for the defence. So these are the people who've gone before and they will witness against us or for us when we face Christ at the judgment seat. 
And they'll say, well, by faith, Abel can say, by faith, I did this. Joseph can say, by faith, I did this. What have you done? They'll witness against us because they've achieved things by faith. And they've gone before. And some didn't accept deliverance. And this is the key to the study. Hebrews 11.35, it said, By faith they achieved things, and what more could we say of Barak and all these people? And women received their dead life, raised to life again. But others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Were they stupid? Why wouldn't you want deliverance when you're being tortured? But they refused deliverance, not because they were stupid or naive. It tells you why, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. And this is the key. What does Paul mean by a better resurrection? I mean, a resurrection is a resurrection. If I'm dead and I'm raised again, how can it be better than that? Why does he talk about a better resurrection? Well, I'm convinced this is the resurrection that Paul was attaining to, about having a glorified spiritual body when it's raised. You know, many people were raised from the dead in Jesus' day. When Jesus died, it said that many came out of the graves. They were resurrected and walked in Jerusalem, but they all died again. They couldn't have had the spiritual body because Jesus was the only one. He was the first fruit, the first of a new creation. Somebody who'd been physical, flesh and blood, and had a glorified body. Jesus was the first, so these couldn't have had a, gl a glorified body. You may say, what about Enoch? But Enoch never died. So he wasn't resurrected, he went straight to heaven. Jesus was the only one or the first one. He was the first fruits, and I don't believe anyone since Jesus has been raised from the dead with a spiritual body. He was the first fruit, and it says, and then us at his resurrection, at his coming. So he was the first fruits, the first one to be flesh and blood, died, and raised again with a spiritual body. And Paul says, and we also will be the same when he comes again. So this is the resurrection I'm arguing that he's talking about, not to be raised from the dead, because many Christians will be raised from the dead in flesh and blood. This is the first resurrection, those who are raised immortal. And that's what Paul wanted to be. He knew that everyone would be raised from the dead. I mean, Hitler will be raised from the dead. George Bush will be raised from the dead. Everyone will be raised from the dead. Genghis Khan, everyone from history will be raised from the dead. Revelation says the sea gave up the dead and death and hell gave up the dead. And they're all raised to face God at the great white throne. But they will be in flesh and blood. They, they'll be in the body that they sinned in to give an account for the life. So those not saved will be in the resurrection in the flesh they died in. And Paul knew that, so when he said that I may obtain the resurrection, he's not talking about this resurrection, because everyone's in it. Why would he strive? Why would he seek to know Christ? And why would he have the fellowship of the sufferings being conformable unto his death? Why would Paul go through all this pain and, and suffering to, to be in the resurrection that Genghis Khan will be in, or Hitler, or Mussolini? It doesn't make sense. He could only have been talking about a better resurrection, the first resurrection. And over those who are in the first resurrection, the second death hath no power. You, you're already immortal. You won't stand at the great white throne. Well, I don't think there's any other logical explanation for this, that he wanted this better resurrection. Well, Logic dictates that if those face who face God at the great white throne, logic dictates that they'll be in the body. Because if they're in a spiritual body, if God gives everyone 
who's damned a spiritual body. When they raised from the dead to face God, if they've all got a spiritual body, how can it burn in the lake of fire? How can it be? A spirit, spiritual body can't burn, can it? A spiritual body can't be tormented. It logic dictates that they'll be raised in the body that they sinned in to face God to give an account for their works. It says the books are open and the dead were judged out of their works, how they've behaved in the body. And of course, if they haven't got the righteousness of Christ, they'll be damned because the works are filthy rags. But they'll stand in the flesh to face God. 2 Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition, damnation of ungodly men. Paul says the earth's now standing, waiting for the reserved by fire. So this whole world's going to be burnt up. We were talking before the the study we were sat out it's a sunny day and we were just talking and we, we we're thinking about houses and lands and possessions and paintings and cars and and we were saying it's all going to be burnt up we christians to take have too much value in the things in this life jesus says don't store treasures on earth you need things we need a car to to go to work we need but you don't need to store things that are not necessary store things in heaven peter said we have an incorruptible inheritance stored in heaven for us well Revelation twenty eleven. What will happen when the earth is destroyed by fire? Let, let's read it. Revelation twenty. This is when the earth, the first heaven and the first earth passed away. This is Revelation twenty, and it says, "And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away." That must be God, not Jesus. Because God destroys the heaven and the earth, not Jesus. And there was found no place for them. The heaven and the earth don't, didn't exist. The sun, the moon, the stars and the earth didn't exist anymore. They'd be burnt by fire. The elements will melt in fervent heat. He said it's like a scroll. You know, you open a scroll, you open it up and it's been scrolled for a year. And when you open a scroll, you let go of it because... A scroll when it's rolled away. That's what the heaven and earth will pass like that. God will, it'll just atomize. It'll go like that and it will be no more. The next verse. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So there's the books and there's the book, the book of life. The books are the deeds of everyone who's ever lived from Adam till, till the heaven and earth's destroyed. God's got a record of all the works we've ever done. Otherwise, how can we stand before God if there's no evidence? God is a judge, and a judge has to have evidence. He can't condemn you, judge, if there's no evidence. Case dismissed. You can't convict somebody unless you've got evidence. If there's no evidence, if the the jury's nobbled and they refuse to witness, the witnesses are nobbled and they refuse to witness, case dismissed. A judge has to have accounts and he has to have evidence. And the, the books are the evidence of everyone who's ever lived their deeds. Every thought, every motive, every action are in the books. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. They're judged. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. These are people who stand in the flesh before God. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the first death is the physical death. The second death must be the spiritual death. Because the first death's physical, we know that. It, the second death must be spiritual. 
And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So all those who weren't in the book of life, the first book to be opened is the book of life. And the, the dead from Adam up till heaven and earth pass and stood before God. And he opened the book of life. And those that are in the, the book of life, they have eternal life. They're in the flesh and blood, they stand before God. And they live on the new earth in the flesh and blood. Just like Adam was flesh and blood, but he had a perfect body. They'll be perfectly healthy. They'll never die. I'll, I'll show you it when we look at Revelation. But those that are not in the book, then they're judged out of the books. The books close the book of life because those who are in it have eternal life. Those that are not in it, if they can't find the names in it, that book's discarded now, that's finished. That book will never be opened again. And the books are opened and the people who are not in the book of life are judged out of the books. The evidence that they couldn't live a holy life, that they've sinned and come short of the glory of God and they're cast into the lake of fire. So not only those who rejected Christ will stand before God at the great white throne in the flesh, but also the Christians who are not in the first resurrection. Because Paul said, I want to attain this first resurrection. So if he didn't attain it, he'd still be in this resurrection to face God. And his name is in the book, so he's all right, he's got eternal love. But he said, I want more than just my salvation. I want to be the bride of Christ. I want to reign with Christ. I want to hear the words, well done. I don't just want to stand before God and my name's in the book. Most Christians are happy with the salvation. I understand that. They're following Christ. They're saved. They've got the ticket to heaven. They don't want to pay the price to live a holy life. They don't want to be separate from the world. I understand that. And they say the name's in the book of life. And they've settled for that. But I don't want to settle for that. I want to be like Paul. Paul says, if any, by any means. And he tells us the process. And it's a painful process, but it's well worth it. They that suffer with Christ will reign with him. So those that are saved, and the names in the book of life, they'll live on the new earth, and they'll be like Adam in the Garden of Eden with a perfect body. If this seems an unusual statement, if, if you can't get your head round because... You know, we've got 2,000 years of church doctrine, haven't we? So it's difficult to read what the Bible says and it doesn't seem right. So we always fit the Bible to our doctrines. But if this seems a strange statement that most Christians will be in flesh and blood on the new earth, you've got to explain to me why the tree of life that keeps mortal man living forever, that was in the Garden of Eden, is also on the new earth. What do we need the tree of life if everyone's got a spiritual body that can't die? We'll never have to eat of that tree ever again because we've got eternal life. Adam had to eat of the tree because it was flesh and blood. And the tree kept mortal man living forever. He would have never died. That's why God put him out of the garden. So he couldn't even the tree of life and live forever in his sinful state. But you still, if you're not sinning, you still need the tree of life to keep mortal man living forever. And what about the leaves of the trees? For the healing of the nations. This is the brand new earth. You can't say, well, it's not chronological because... Chapter 22 says heaven and earth has passed away and this is the new earth. So it's talking about the new earth, so you can't fit it into anything else. You can't say it's not chronological, this part. And it says the tree are for the healing of the nations. Well, in other words, to keep them healthy. Why would you need that if everyone on earth has got a new body? So the new earth, there's New Jerusalem. I saw New Jerusalem as a bride coming down out of heaven, as a bride prepared for a husband to the new earth. That's the bride of Christ, New Jerusalem. And the temple is there in the city. And the nations that are saved are on the new earth. So there, there's two classes of people. There's New Jerusalem, which is the bride, and there's the nations that are saved. One is spiritual, have a spiritual body, and one has a, a natural body, but perfect. And they need this to stay alive. 
and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. This is from New Jerusalem. And yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. That's the tree that was in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life. God put two trees in the Garden of Eden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they were forbidden, and the tree of life that would keep them living forever. So the two trees, because they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they could no longer eat of the tree of life. You can't eat of the two trees at once. They had a choice. Well, they kept eating of the tree of life. They would live forever. When they ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God says, I'll have to put you out of the garden and put cherubims to keep the way of life. God hid it. I believe it was disappeared in the flood. Maybe that was Atlantis. I don't know that people talk about. But we know that the garden of Eden is not anywhere now. And the tree of life was lost. So Adam began to die because he, he hadn't the means to live forever. So the tree of life keeps mortal man living forever. I know I keep saying it, but it's, it's important to get it into our minds. So let me read Revelation 20, verse 1 to 6. Those in the first resurrection were real with Christ for the duration of the millennial reign, and they won't have to face the white throne judgment. So Revelation 20, verse 1 to 6. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. This is the beginning of the millennium. Jesus has come again, and, and then it says this. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, so that Christ and his bride can reign on earth. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones... And they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They suffer with Christ. But the rest of the dead live not again. But he's talking to Christians. But the rest of the dead live not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This is the resurrection Paul wanted to be in. And it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. You won't have to face God at the great white throne to see if your name is in the book. It's no power over you because you've already got the eternal body. You've got the spiritual body. You'll, you can't die. You'll live forever. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it's obvious if they've got a spiritual body, the fate's sealed and they live with Christ for a thousand years as, as his bride and reign with him. And the rest of those that are saved face God at the great white throne. The names are in the book of life. They'll live forever on the new earth. That's great. So let me say it again. The nations that are saved, the Christians who are saved, They'll be in nations are not the bride of Christ. They're not New Jerusalem because there's clearly a separation. Well, if I've not convinced you that all those who are saved will not be in the first resurrection, I can do no more than read Paul's statements after this verse we're looking at, the process that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellow ship of his suffering, being conformable unto his death. If by any means I may obtain the resurrection, let me tell you how Paul was striving for it. 
let's let's finish by looking at these verses. There's quite a few verses. I believe this was the prize of the high calling that Paul had his eyes on. He claimed he was striving for this resurrection. Well, you don't have to strive if every every Christian's going to be raised from the dead. What, where's the striving? If we're all the bride of Christ, well, I've got my salvation. Why do I have to strive? But he said he was striving and pressing towards it. Let me read what Paul says. And I want to be like Paul. So it's Philippians 3, and it's just after verse 10 that we've looked at in the last few studies. Philippians 3, verse 11 to 21. If by any means I may obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. This is what the four points were about. Not as though I'd already attained. So he said, I, I, I don't know whether I've attained it yet. Either we're already perfect. That means mature. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. So I'm not there yet, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm forgetting those things which are behind, and I'm reaching forth into those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in giant. Christ Jesus. What's the prize of the high calling? He's told you it's the first resurrection. We talk about the prize as though it's some reward be over ten cities, but it's the resurrection in context. Let us therefore, as many as be mature, perfect, be thus minded. So he's encouraging us. If you're like-minded, have the same aspirations as I have. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God will reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same things. Let's have unity and press towards the mark together. Brethren, be followers of me. Paul said it a few times, be followers of me as I am of Christ. And he said, you know, when Paul says follow me, it's important to know what he, the context. What he said is follow me to the first resurrection don't just follow me to do miracles follow me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for as example so he's an example of somebody who's after the first resurrection for many walk of whom i've told you often and now I'll tell you even weeping they're the enemies of the cross of christ wow he's talking about christians whose end is destruction whose god is their belly whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. He says they're enemies of the cross. Christians who are worldly, who mind earthly things, who are getting treasures on earth. He said they're enemies of the cross because they're stopping you, the cross in your life. They don't want you to suffer. They're saying you should enjoy life. You shouldn't suffer for Christ. They're enemies of this cross that we're supposed to cru be crucified on. So they're stopping you getting this first resurrection. They're enemies. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies. He's talking about the resurrection, that it be fashioned in, like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's the end of the chapter. That's worth reading again a few times, isn't it? Paul says, be followers of me because I'm an example of somebody who's after the first resurrection. So there's too many conditions to obtain the, the kingdom. You know, it, it's not a full conclusion that we're the bride of Christ and we'll be in the first resurrection. As I say, there's too many conditions. I've, I, let me advertise a couple of books. I've written six books on the Sermon on the Mount, and these tell you how to be mature, to how to get the in the first resurrection, the conditions. The meek, they'll inherit the earth. And I've written another four books, Parables of the Kingdom, Qualifications, How to Reign with Christ. Uh, I can recommend those books, and they're on uh, Amazon, uh, 
uh, at our shop. You know, when Paul wrote to the Philippians, he said, if by any means. But you know, when he was going to his death, he knew. So that's a comfort, isn't it? That before you depart from this earth, Paul knew when his time came that he'd obtained the price. Let me read what he says. Acts 26, so this is the end of Paul's life. He says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. So he did what God said. God said, you'll suffer for my name's sake. He said, I wasn't disobedient. Agabus prophesied that, Ananias prophesied that I would suffer. He says, I've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. And what he said to Timothy in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered. So he knew that he was going to be martyred. And the time of my departure is at hand. So this is, he knows now, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous shall, shall give me on that day. And not only to me, but also all to to them also that love is appearing. He said, I know there's a crown of life. I've got the crown. I've got the prize. I'm going to reign with Christ because a crown is for reigning, isn't it? If you think it's not out of context. A cr you can't have a, a crown if you're not reigning. Because it said those in the first resurrection, they'll reign as kings and priests. So he's got his crown. That's his prize, the resurrected body. Well, I've come to an end. Let's strive with Paul to obtain the kingdom and the prize of the high calling. Let's strive to be the bride of Christ. You know, as a Christian, what a wonderful aspiration. And what a wonderful motivation to suffer hardship as a good soldier. Like Paul, and who was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So that we're qualified to reign with Christ for a thousand years. Well, I'll finish there. This is the end of those four little studies in Philippians 3, verse 10. The next study, only one purpose. You know, all the five ministries, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, they're all for one purpose. They're not running different ways. They're not different ministries in the sense they're parts of one ministry. There's only one purpose for the fivefold ministry. And I'll explain it in detail. Hopefully it will, uh, dare I say, educate you, if it's not insulting you. But it certainly give you something to think about. So have a brilliant week. God bless you. Tune in for the next study.